Recording in progress. Is now in progress. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Teresa, why don't you do this tonight? Please stand and put your right hand on your heart and join with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Roll we'll call Gina. Director Avila? Here. Director Dennert? Here. Director Freeman? Here. Vice Chair Gray? Here. Chair O'Brien? Here. Item three, agenda review. Are there any changes? Thank you, Chair. Staff has no recommended amendments to the agenda. Item four, public statements. Items not on the agenda. I have no green cards and I don't see anyone on the Zoom screen. Any public, for anyone who wants to make a public comment? Going once, twice, okay. I have a final approval of minutes. I'll move approval. I have one minor change. Item 9A, um, I wanted to, I made a comment about um, uh, raising the fee, when we're raising the fees by 6%, uh, when I was in favor of that, I. Part of the reason is because I want us to be less dependent on tax revenues. The more less less dependent we are on tax revenues, the less we have to worry about if uh, Sacramento comes knocking on our door. Other than that, it was fine. We'll update the minutes to reflect the change. Okay. My motion will stand as approved as amended. Okay. Second. All right. Uh, Gina, roll call. Director Avalon. Aye. Director Dennert. Yes. Director Freeman? Yes. Uh, Director, or Vice Chair Gray? Aye. And Chair O'Brien? Yes. The motion carries with the unanimous vote. Okay. Item five. Oh, we did that. Hello. Item six, consent agenda. Any changes, questions about the consent agenda? No? Let's move approval. Do I hear a second? I'll second. All right. Roll call. <laughs> Director Avila? Aye. Director Dunnert? Yes. Director Freeman? Aye. Vice Chair Gray? Aye. Chair O'Brien? Yes. A motion carries with the unanimous vote. Okay. Item seven, presentations, scheduled items, and public hearings. A, presentation of the full-time employee of the month for December 21. 2021 to Enrique Gachuico. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Teresa Pennington, the Director of Administration, will provide staff's report. Thank you. The full time employee of the month for December 2021 is Enrique Eric Gachuico. Eric is a building maintenance worker one in the Recreation Department. He has worked for the district for nine years, and this is his first employee of the month award. The person who nominated Eric stated the following. I have had the privilege of working with Eric over the years and most recently at the Oak Park Community Center. He always goes out of his way to accommodate staff. Eric is the primary maintenance employee at the community center where he performs the setup and breakdown of equipment to facilitate rentals, events, and functions. This also includes the general cleaning of the buildings. During the COVID closure, he performed tasks in addition to his normal job responsibilities while also maintaining the facility. Eric adjusted his schedule to accommodate evening classes and weekend events. He's always smiling and has a positive attitude. Eric's pleasant greeting will make your day. For these reasons and so many others, Eric is deserving of the Employee of the Month Award. And Eric's with us this evening, if you wanna come on up. to the board and I just want to say thank you for the person who nominated me and uh, thank you for the support and the recognition. Thank you very much. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Eric. If I can make a comment. Um, we have to do obligatory photo. Thank you, Mary. 
Chair, if I could briefly comment. Kate, if I could make, make a brief comment. Yes, you may. Right. Uh, I, I, congratulations, and I, I mentioned this whenever one of our um, great maintenance workers uh, gets one of these awards. Um, thank you for all you do, but especially in seeing that it's even noted in the, um, uh, in the reason you were nominated, especially for your work uh, during the closure, during the pandemic, and, and the circumstances that we were under, that we were able to keep our parks going. Obviously, you were a part of that, and that means so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Ed. Thank you. Okay. Item B, 17. Status of the district response to the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Thank you, Chair and Board. As, uh, as is in going on right now, it's been challenging for us the last couple of weeks, and probably will be challenging for the next couple of weeks not like other areas um, in our community and uh, in the country, actually. Um, <clears throat> we have had quite a number of positives amongst the staff. Um, within that number, though, it has not been in any one single area or facility. It's been kind of spread throughout the district, but we have had a high number of COVID positives in the last 10 days or so. Um, another note on that is, as far as we know, through contact tracing, a lot of that's not their folks aren't um, getting it through from the district or through the district. It's usually folks bringing it in from something in their personal life. So, um, but it is it is up. And um, that being said, uh, Teresa and her staff have been working hard on the CDC protocols and guidelines. That's what we're following in terms of uh, uh, quarantines and all the rules that you have to follow if you're either exposed or you actually have the virus. So. When we do get somebody that's positive or somebody that's been exposed, we follow those protocols. Um, that being said, it's uh, still open. Things are good. Our, I saw our registration numbers. Are, we had a very good December, so folks are still registering for our classes, at least as of December. Um, and from what I understand, we're just going to have to all kind of hunker down and get through the next few weeks from the data I've been seeing. So that being said, that's your COVID report for this evening. Um, how about we, we got an email today about uh, from someone named Brett about yes yeah. I meant to mention that it's in my notes we did get a complaint regarding masking at the center which I think that's the second or third one we've received in the last three months so um, I uh, made contact out there and I'm gonna have to visit out there and make sure that our staff is following the masking policy out there that, that facility is a little bit challenging because that's where we, not, not to make excuses, but that's where we do a lot of our sports activities, basketball and different things like that. And there's kids in there and that kind of thing. So it's just an environment where we try to be perfect and have the kids and everybody wearing masks and the coaches at all times. But as a practical matter, um, that sometimes we forget that a little bit, but we just got to remind ourselves and do the best we can to make sure that we're following the masking policy. So we'll send that message to the staff again um, and do the best we can to stay masked up. Right. Dan, who's in charge of enforcing that? Uh, it would be the supervisor on, on e at each of the sites, at each of our buildings, so the two centers in this building. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Dan, there's been some discussion from the CDC, but no, to my awareness, no official stance yet that they may change uh, the COVID guidance for testing for certain individuals. Um, I know for after school clubs and, and uh, you know, related to kids, we've been able to uh, get tested with the school employees have been able to get tested with the school district employees in the past. Um, should, if the guidance were to change, would you think we would be able to uh, still manage that testing if, if the guidance were to change? Would we be able to manage the new testing requirement? Yeah, I think it, it did come out today and they're recommending in, in certain circumstances that you get a test after a five day period. So I, that's a good idea, Director Gray. So in the schools and the after school clubs, we're under a different set of protocols, if you recall. Um, all of our staff on the campuses that aren't vaccinated are required to get um, tested as of now. Um, but that is a good idea. What we can do is I can have Teresa reach out and see if we can get some tests um, that we can have here at the district 
for employees and uh, we did get a batch of tests I think about a couple months ago that have, have since expired but we could try to reach out and have tests on site and then when we have that testing protocol that may change or not we can have tests on site here at the district for our staff yeah. I would also encourage I know in the past uh, Supervisor Huber's office has had excess tests right. uh, the chamber has uh, I know this is different circumstances than when they had excess but um, I figure if somebody has them, uh, yes. you know, we should, we should claim them. Yes, I agree. So uh, Teresa and I will work on that, see if we can get some tests for us. We have an order pending with the state. We have an order pending with the state, Teresa tells me. So as soon as we can get them, we'll have them. And we'll call Bob's office, Mr. Huber's office, to see if they have any as well. Perfect. Thank you. Any From other a teacher's perspective, uh, from a teacher's perspective, it's a pretty tough time right now. There's a lot of students that have tested positive, and some of them are sick, and some of them are asymptomatic and just quarantined. So we need to do our best to keep each other safe. Uh, we already have a labor shortage. I don't want any more students, uh, if we could control it, to have to stay home for five or 10 days or any more staff, because it's really grinding down on what happens at schools. So I encourage everybody to do everything you can to keep safe and keep each other safe. Hey, any other questions, comments? I have a question. Okay. What is the status, I think it's on hold, of the requirement on 100 employees that I thought by the uh, federal government and you received the document, but I think it was put on hold, wasn't it, that they all had to be vaccinated? Correct, that is, uh, I believe that was challenged in the courts. Right. And it's working its way through the court system. As of now, I just heard from Capri today, we got an email and the, the mandated vaccine requirement that the federal government had proposed is on complete hold. That's about all I know, so that is not, not, not law right now. It's my understanding that the tests are very difficult to come by. They were um, a week ago, but <clears throat> A week ago, it was extremely difficult. I think they're getting more out there now. I know that Brian, I think the schools got some tests, so they are getting some shipments of tests, and so it's opening back up. <clears throat> but it was difficult about a week ago, yes. Uh, do we foresee, I know you said we have a number of staff uh, either exposed or do have COVID? Do have COVID. Uh, do we foresee that number continuing to increase at this point? Uh, from the number numbers I've seen, they're projecting COVID to be high numbers through January. So we had the holiday spike um, and whatever trailing edge we have that with the staff. And again, just talking anecdotally from what I'm aware of um, and from what I'm seeing out of the Cal State campuses and UCs and other things, they're saying it could be consistent through the month of January and it should start to relieve into January, beginning of February is what I've been hearing. Now, when we say COVID, do we mean the original COVID or are we talking about the variant, the Omicron variant? I don't know. Okay. I, I, have, I have one question. Um, the, um, the staff that, that uh, uh, has COVID, um, I assume they have some sort of symptoms or they probably wouldn't have got tested in the first place or did they just get tested apart from symptoms? Are any of them seriously ill? What can you say about that? Um, to my knowledge, none of them are seriously ill. And it's either you've been exposed, you have a family member or a friend who's got it, you may not have symptoms and you go test and you have it or you may have symptoms. So it's a little of both. But to my knowledge, there's no one that is seriously ill. It's been, you know, cold-like symptoms and you know, flu-like, but not, nothing extreme to my knowledge. Dan, I know you might not have it in front of you, but what's your estimate? How many uh, employees are out quarantined or sick? Ten. Okay. Were um, any of these uh, employees exposed? Have they been vaccinated or were they really unvaccinated? I don't know, and we cannot. I, I don't know that. I'm hearing, I'm just like you guys, I've got friends that have been boosted and got it. I just heard today a friend of mine who got the booster got the COVID and other people don't. So I've heard of several folks who are vaccinated who have also gotten it. So, but 
my understand if you do to get that, the likelihood of you know, getting sick or really sick is reduced. It's like a flu shot. You sometimes can get the flu when you had the flu shot, but it's much milder. So we have quite a few. Um, we will be tracking it closely, and it, it, could, it, it could impact our staffing levels. Um, we put protocols in place. We're all much more aware of it. We're staying distance from each other. We're all masking up in our offices, and um, we could coach the employees to keep your distance. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful we're at our peak, and we start to see that uh, that high number we have now go down. Uh, but it, it is it is a staffing issue as well. Certainly, the employees are the most, and their health are the most important thing to us. But um, so that programs to run as well. So we're doing the best we can to keep those going. I'm really hopeful that ours is spiked right now. So. But we'll keep a track of that, and if there's anything that we think we need to do as staff or recommend to the board, we can certainly keep you guys informed, um, you know, over the phone and the email. I won't wait till the next meeting to report anything out if it gets more extreme. Uh, Dan. Yeah. Uh, say it doesn't go according to plan. In worst case scenario, uh, a lot more staff do come down with COVID or test positive. Um, what? Is there a department or a specific part of what we do that you're concerned with that would have the, the greatest burden due to labor shortage? Um, probably the after school clubs. That's where we have the most staff in one particular program at any given time. So that would be the largest concern. I will say that we are, we're following the public health director's protocols. If you guys will recall, mm -hmm. He had the stay-at-home order. He ordered businesses to shut down and restaurants to shut down and all of that stuff. We're not hearing any of that out of county public health. So um, I, you know, just following, you know, what's going on and following the advice of our public health officers, um, I haven't heard anything um, of the sort coming down the pike. I think we've got vaccinations now, and um, I guess we can handle it a little bit better. Um, a lot of that number was driven by hospitalizations, if you'll recall, you know, a year and a half ago. Um, so I'm sure if it reaches that level, Director Gray, that the public health officer will be putting down some more stringent requirements, but I haven't heard anything of the sort um, yet. There are, we always have the options. We have always followed the public health guidelines, but you as a board and us as an organization can go above and beyond those if we so choose. There are some organizations that are doing that, but our policy direction and what we've been doing since the beginning of COVID is just to follow public health mandates and CDC guidelines. The board does have the option to do something more, and if it does get, um, say, you know, real extreme for us or impactful, I would certainly consult with the board, maybe call a special meeting or something of the sort if it got to a level where it had some significant impacts on uh, you know, our operations and our programs and obviously our staff. So I would envision if that spikes up here in the next few days, couple weeks, uh, we'd probably be having a special meeting and talking about what we might need to do to, to curtail it. Okay. Thank you. I just appreciate that insight and that background. Uh, what you... Any more Dan, questions? I, Dan, I also I appreciate this insight. Um, two of my friends that have child care not through the park district. But both their child care for their uh, kids under age five, six have been closed already because of staffing shortages. Right. Because of coronavirus, not just labor shortage. So when the county tells us to uh, suggest that we uh, limit indoor unnecessary activities, I don't see child care as an unnecessary activity because children need to be supervised. But if there's things that we determine are unnecessary, to be indoors, right? You need to call a special meeting or anything else to keep our employees safe and uh, providing service for our community. I'm open to that. Okay. Okay. Is, okay. Was that? Was there? Was there anything else that you had, Dan? On the? Um... No, sir. No. So I, I just want to one more thing. Um, so my understanding is um, we we received. Uh, Three point two million dollars from the state in COVID funding. Is that correct? Correct. It is. Yes. Right. So I just want to um, um, uh, again. I want to congratulate you and the staff. On, I think that's outstanding, um, and uh, I think it all it, certainly it makes me proud. It should make us all proud um, as a district that we were able to secure that. Um, 
we went to great lengths to um, keep our uh, parks and trails and golf courses open during the pandemic. Um, and that required a lot of staff effort, a lot of staff time, and a lot of safety precautions to do it correctly. And uh, so, um, I, I, again, I, I applaud you on getting that. It's something that will be uh, a benefit uh, to the district, and that's just excellent work. Yeah, thank you. And I would just to share the share the kudos, I guess, the, the California Special Districts Association, our local chapter, was instrumental in lobbying the state to even get a pot of money for special districts. And then for us, Teresa and Miguel helped me a lot in the lobbying effort and running numbers and um, making sure we stayed on top of that. So it was a team effort. Um, yes, it is. Uh, uh, if the board will recall, my estimated number of net losses was about 3.7 million. So we got 3.2 million from the state and we got some assistance from the city for a capital project. So. Um, I'll be making some recommendations on what to do with that funding. It's going to kind of backfill our losses, but those losses, um, we didn't fund some capital projects that we may have liked to do at the time. So we'll probably uh, address that in this year's budget process, which we as staff are already starting. So we'll do that in May as part of the workshop and talk about how that shakes out in our budget relative to projects and other items. But thank, I want to thank the board also for all of your efforts and all of you guys were great with the city and being supportive of us spending the time to, to make sure that happened. And I think we sent a few letters on behalf of the district in support of the effort. So, but I do think I agree with you, uh, Director Avila Parks and what we did is on the front line, uh, public policy dictated outdoor activities. And we are the ones that did that under the board's direction. Um, you encouraged us to stay open and offer that for our community. And I think it was just that um, we finally were able to um, receive some consideration as all other sectors of the economy did. So uh, thank you to the board and thank you for the direction and keeping us open and keeping our finances healthy, but also uh, getting us whole again. So appreciate the board's effort in that as well. And, and just again, to, to the entire staff, the maintenance staff for keeping us yes. open in a safe manner. Okay. Item seven, we are done. Item eight, continued business, there is none. Item nine, new business. Nine A, approval, approval of the second revised agreement between the district and the City Valley Historical Society and Museum, and adoption of resolution number 2022, amending the policy <coughs> manual related to facility use fees and conditions at Strathern Historical Park and Museum. Thank you, Chair and Board. First, I want to acknowledge Linda Bosley. She is the leader of the Historical Society, and she's on what on uh, Zoom with us this evening. She's available for any questions you may have of her. Um, but she's done an excellent job working with us to review this agreement and update it. <clears throat> that being said, we've got a we've had a long, as the board knows, just background for the record. We've had a long, great relationship with the Historical Society, and particularly the volunteers. Um, at the Historical Society. They have put, done a yeoman's job as a volunteer group to help um, create the Strathern Museum and the programming out there. And we've got a whole host of thousands of volunteer hours over the thousands and thousands of volunteer hours over the years. Um, and that continues today. They're as busy as ever. Um, they're picking up the load and helping our staff uh, through change and through a lot of work. And they continue to do a great job for us out there. That being said, we do have an agreement with them that was actually entered into in 1969, and the last time it was updated was in 1996. So since that time, there's been quite a few changes out there, both operationally, but also with, with staff, evolving staff, uh, changing volunteer dynamics, all of those types of things. Um, so over the, I think it was about a year ago, uh, Lynn and I got together and uh, the staff and we talked about uh, taking a look at the agreement and seeing if there's, we could clarify it and bring it more up to date given today's, uh, what's going on today. <clears throat> A couple, of, a couple of things that stood out was um, over the years kind of got a little uh, squirrely on who was responsible for what 
and I don't mean in a big way, just you know, kind of subtly, whether it was a park district responsibility or historical responsibility under the agreement and exactly who was doing what. So as a part of the effort, um, Linda and I and her board and our staff worked together to kind of clarify those duties and responsibilities to make sure we had some guidelines to pull out um, when we needed to um, get back kind of in line with what of our, each of our respective roles are in operating the park and the museum. Um, as a part of that, um, over the year, we added some staff out there. Um, we didn't have part-time staff actually on, or we had part-time, we didn't have full-time staff out there. Um, I think over the years, the staffing need has grown and now we have a full-time position out there. Um, as that evolved, the Historical Society at one point had agreed to pay for 50% of the staffing. Uh, I think when we started with one part-timer or maybe two, they were gonna pay for 50% of that. As the staffing need grew more, they, we capped that at $14,000, and now it's, it's grown even more. Um, in addition to that, um, so they, they've been paying for that. In addition to that, we've been sharing the um, revenue um, from rentals out there. So from a practical perspective, what happens is we do the rentals. Um, it's, it's ranged between seventeen and $30,000 a year, 40% um, of it, but um, so, uh, so we've, we've <coughs> excuse me, um, <clears throat> so we've been sharing, the, so we, we get rentals, we get 100% of it, we've been pa uh, providing 40% of that to the historical society, and they in turn have been using that money to help support the staffing, some maintenance needs, some capital needs, and other things. And looking at the purpose of that and where we are today, we think, it, and also with the staffing model, we think it makes more sense today for the district just to keep the 100% of the rental revenue. Um, and then we provide them a grant that's basically an equivalent amount of what the rental revenue is. Um, and with that, what we'll be able to do is, it's, we have four staff out there now, three of the staff will work for the district, and one of the staff members will actually work directly for the historical society. And they'll be able to support that position with the, with the grant money we're proposing to give to them. Um, likewise, the rentals, um, as we do more or fewer rentals out there, hopefully more, uh, we've been talking about weddings and wedding fees, we've been talking about doing other rental events out there, Park District will retain 100% of the fees from that. On the other side of that, uh, the Historical Society will get a stable grant that they can count on each and every year in their budget to support their needs. Through that, obviously, we will still continue to work together. Our staff will continue to support the society, just like the society will continue to support us. That being said, um, we're recommending some adjustments. One is to um, update the staff responsibilities, to undo what I'll call the revenue share, and replace that with a grant in lieu each year of $24,000, and then we provide some other updates to the agreements and some, some, some non-substantive ones. So, um, staff's recommendation is that the board uh, approve the second revised agreement and also adopt the resolution amending the policy manual um, to recast how we're, uh, what we're doing with the rental fee revenue. That concludes staff's report. Okay. Are there any uh, questions? I have one question. Um, on page of the, the red line version, third page, <coughs> item, uh, item two, I think it is. I don't recall any discussion about um, uh, a new caretaker apartment. Is that just like up, updating the house, or what is that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we've got a t we've got a master plan out there from two thousand one. Okay. And what that master plan actually says is that we were going to hopefully someday get a permanent building out there. Right now it's a modular building that the museum sits in. Uh -huh. And the concept at the time was that the caretaker facility, the caretaker would be more of an add-on to the museum rather than a separate building. So since that time we've added a separate building as the caretaker facility. Okay. So because the 2001 master plan still has that in here, we're still acknowledging that in the agreement. If at some point we were able to get a permanent structure out there, we'd probably revisit the 2001 master plan to make sure that the caretaker um, residence, whether it be a part of it or whether it be where it is now, um, 
was accounted for, but mainly that's in there because it's kind of fixed in that master plan. Okay, all right, that was my only question. I had one other thing <coughs> you asked it already in the staff report. Any more questions? Any questions? No question, just a comment. Comment. On the distribution of duties, um, the chart, I thought that was really uh, very clear. And I think it, um, because there's so many events going on and there is an overlap and the um, benefits to the event, and the overcrossing of staff. Um, I thought this really um, spelled it out well. And there's still some areas where it's going to be joint participation. But you know, if there's ever um, any question by whose responsibility it is, at least we can look at this and get a clear understanding of who's doing what. You know where the responsibility lies. I think this was probably part of Carolyn's uh, concern too, and, and so I'm really pleased that this um, got defined by the um, responsibilities. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Any, any comments from the public? I see the public. I think Ms. Bosley may want to make comment potentially. Linda? I, I did want to mention that the Historical Society Board reviewed this last week in a special meeting and uh, approved this recommended agreement to the board. Yes. So they did. My turn now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so I uh, don't really have anything to add. Get on here. There we go. Yeah. I really don't have anything to add. Um, we were able to work things through. Um, since June. Um, the idea, by the way, behind switching over from the rental income to the grant, um, I suggested that because on your end, it takes man hours to process that information. So at the site, your full-time employee quarterly has to determine what the 40% is based upon the rental fees. So in the past, that person has gone back to the contracts and tallies up so that takes time away from their job and then it's submitted to your accounting department who then has to verify it and then quarterly cut us a check um so when we were discussing this back in june i threw the idea out and uh again asking for a number so i simply went back to uh like the last five years pre-covid of our rental income and did an average I uh, you know some people will say, well, why didn't you round it up to 25,000 instead of 24? Because that's the average. Okay, we're not looking to count the district. That is the average. So that's where that next number came from. I know the can explain that uh, earlier. And um, we're very grateful that the park district does support us uh, with the money. And with that money, we pay for insurance, we pay for our own employees, so there won't be this question for you uh, issue with employees the park district has their dedicated to have our dedicated and um, all the money that is given to us whether it was in rentals or now in grants stays at the park and i think that most of you understand that and whoever the breakdown when down supplied our financials we have for several years so we could see money in and money out because we are all volunteers except for our employees. <laughs> uh, are there any questions for me? Sure, if I could, I'd just like to add that we always have the opportunity to bring it back. If, uh, if sir, you know, we're trying this out, we think it'll work better for both parties or both groups. Um, if for some reason it's not quite working the way we have envisioned it working, we can always come back to the board and have a discussion about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And it is, it is a five-year agreement. Um, it was supposed to be reviewed every five years starting in 1996 so going forward and the 25 years it was not um, we did put a starting year into the contract 2027 um, i come from a state park volunteer background where they do review the contracts with the historical societies every five years so this is something that we need to definitely do and revisit and um, 
Yeah, it was great working with Dan and Lane. By the way, um, Lane, I think you commented about the flowchart, our responsibilities. Uh, that came from Wayne. He did a fantastic job on that. Really and Linda, I really want to thank you. You put a lot of time into this, and I know you've been working really hard out there through COVID and trying to keep your operation together and keep the docents and the volunteers in order. And on top of that, you took on this task of reviewing this agreement with us. So. Um, thank you very much for all of your volunteer time in helping us to get to, get to tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. Linda, I do have a question. How happy are you with the agreement as it is now? Um, I'm extremely pleased with it. Um, we did have some compromise, and that's just how government works, you know. Sometimes you have to compromise on certain things and prioritize. Um, we had a few amendments that were very minimal and down the strip of those. We just had to hammer out responsibilities and, you know, money and uh, be able to explain to you guys, you know, what happens with the money and you know, all that kind of stuff. But I'm extremely pleased. And the board vote on um, last Wednesday was unanimous. It was unanimous. Then I saw the, the minutes and uh, about the Martin Luther King Day at the park. Mm -hmm. Is that something uh, Elaine or Kate could update me at the end of the meeting? As far as the day of service at the park? Yeah, I just didn't know if uh, you had enough volunteers and what was planned. Uh, we are going to be painting the green wrought iron fence that is at the front of the park. And so tentatively we have planned to have the um, Park District volunteers on the outside and the Historical Society volunteers inside, so these kind of work in tandem. And the uh, Park District is supplying the paint, the brushes, etc. Uh, and we're doing two shifts uh, 9 a.m. to 12 and 12 to 3. Uh, Wayne estimates that it will take uh, four to six hours to complete the project. Um, on our end, we're all old people, so it may take us a little long. Actually, that's quite pretty good. Um, I, and I don't know that they have enough volunteers, so if there are high school kids who would like to volunteer and need service hours, which is something to do. Um, I manage those kid kind of kids all the time at all of our events. So I would be happy to, or you can go to the park district now. Um, either way, I'd be happy to have it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's no more questions or comments, I'll entertain a motion. Okay. between the district and the historical society adopt a resolution amending the policy manual relating to facility use fees and conditions at the Strathern State Historical Park and Museum. Okay, do I hear a second? I'll second it. Okay, roll call. Uh, Director Avila? Aye. Director Dennerts? Yes. Director Freeman? Yes. Vice Chair Gray? Aye. Chair O'Brien? Yes. And the motion carries with the unanimous vote. Okay. Item 9B. Award of contract for golf cart fleet at Simi Mills Golf Course. Thank you, Chair. Golf Course Manager Brian Reed will provide staff's report. Evening, Honorable Chair, members of the board. My report tonight will uh, seek authorization to award a golf cart uh, contract for Simi Hills Golf Course. I'll go through the background and discuss the bid specs and go over the uh, prices that were provided, uh, the quotes that we received, and uh, our methodology there, and then uh, answer any questions that you may have um, at the end. Uh, as you know, in uh, October, we went out to bo uh, the board authorized the staff to go out to uh, request for proposals for a 36 month uh, lease for golf carts and utility carts at Simi Hills Golf Course. Uh, the RFP was advertised and a copy of the RFP was sent directly to the three major golf cart vendors. Uh, in response to the RFP, uh, two of the three vendors uh, submitted proposals, Club Car and Yamaha Golf Cart Company. The third vendor, uh, EasyGo, declined to submit a proposal because they had su suspended issuing quotes uh, because of supply problems. They were committed all the way through 2022 and would not have been able to provide any kind of vehicles until 2023 or uh, later. Uh, so for various operational and financial reasons, uh, staff recommended not including GPS units on the next fleet of golf carts. 
the two, uh, the two uh, proposals were reviewed in November, uh, taking into consideration the cost offered, the completeness, and the delivery date. Uh, both vendors proposed vehicles which complied with the bid specs, and both uh, vendors' vehicles would serve our needs well. Um, the, since the decision was made um, to not include GPS units on this next fleet of carts, uh, some, some of our customers may see this as a downgrade. So staff in, uh, included a few options uh, in the bid specs, as a, such as upgraded windshields, uh, phone chargers, and steering wheels. Um, the RFP also included space for additional add-ons and upgrades, um, such as lithium batteries, uh, touring seats, which are like a bucket seat, and um, upgraded paint. If chosen by the board, these options would uh, give the carts a little bit more of a premium look and feel and would help offset the exclusion of the GPS units. Uh, Yamaha, Yamaha Golf Cart Company uh, provided the lowest cost on the base bid specs and also significantly lower prices for lithium batteries. Club Car uh, provided a higher base price and a, high, and a significantly higher price for lithium batteries and upgraded paint but slightly overall um, lower price for upgraded seats. Uh, Yamaha also gave us a price for upgraded alloy wheels, which staff uh, felt would be nice, but is not necessary. Uh, Yamaha quoted 2022 model carts and uh, Club Car uh, quoted 2023 model carts. Uh, the reasoning for that is Yamaha would be available, uh, car carts would be available in the uh, uh, middle of summer. Uh, they quoted June 1st, Assuming a contract date of June of December 17th, which was our initial plan was to have this report to you last month, but uh, there was uh, some scheduling problems. Uh, so we are slightly past our estimated date of awarding a contract to them. So that delivery date may have slid, slid a little bit based on other commitments that they've made since then. Uh, but I would assume June, July for Yamaha and then uh, October 1st was what Club Car quoted us. Um, which may have also slid a little bit at this point. Uh, we wouldn't, won't know until we uh, reach out to them. Uh, both Club Car and Yamaha are reputable companies and both vehicles satisfy our, our requirements for operations. Uh, staff believes including lithium batteries and upgraded seats will be sufficient to offset most of the negative feedback we'll get um, for removing the GPS units. Um, although the RFP included an option for upgraded paint, uh, staff feels that this is an unnecessary response. The, um, the stock colors that both companies offer are acceptable. They're, you know, we don't really need the metallic flake, you know, bronze color. It's an unnecessary expense. Uh, while the seat upgrade is uh, simply for aesthetics, the upgrade to lithium batteries actually has three key advantages. Uh, first, they're 250 pounds lighter, uh, which is about a third-ish of the overall weight of a golf cart. Uh, which makes uh, less impact on the golf course. Uh, two, they charge faster and they consume less power overall, which saves us a considerable amount of money. Uh, typically, lithium golf carts consume about half the uh, power that a regular golf cart does with lead acid batteries, uh, which should save us in the range of $10,000 a year in charging costs, which, uh, and then three, they're maintenance free. It's a sealed unit, uh, which also saves us maintenance time. Uh, most golf courses extend the release terms when they switch to lithium. Uh, both reps told me that uh, typically they see a lot of golf courses going to 48 or 60 month leases uh, when they go to upgraded uh, batteries because you know they're sealed and maintenance free and they last longer. Uh, but we feel that because of the general wear and tear that we put our golf carts through uh, being a public course, we, we'd prefer to stick with the three year uh, turnaround uh, just to keep them looking fresh uh, more often. And it doesn't change the price that much. Um, so you can see the, um, the base prices are included in the uh, board report. Um, uh, both the uh, golf carts and utility carts. Uh, the, the base monthly lease cost uh, with Yamaha is $8,300 versus $95 for your club car, which is typically what we see every time we go out to bid. Club car is a little bit uh, more of an expensive vehicle. Uh, with the uh, upgrades, uh, that's where the big difference shows up. 9100 for Yamaha versus 11500 for Club Car. They wanted considerably more for the upgrade to lithium batteries. Uh, the total contract cost is 413000 with Club Car versus 328000 with Yamaha. 
Uh, Yamaha Golf Cart is, is the uh, lowest bidder as they have been the last three times that we've gone out to bid. And they are also proposing the most advantage, uh, advantage, advantageous delivery date. Uh, they also offer, uh, represent the lowest co total cost of transition because they'll deliver new vehicles, uh, offload them, disassemble, you know, assemble the new ones, and then take the old carts back in the same uh, same trucks, which saves them money, which uh, uh, saves on the overall cost of transport. Uh, and they also, since we're ro rolling over from one fleet of Yamaha to another, they're generally a little bit more amenable to looking the other way on the little dings and scratches and normal wear and tear that uh, golf carts receive over the years. Uh, Club Cars proposal was higher in price, but they are seen as a higher end vehicle. Typically at Country Club, you see a Club Car, uh, and so they do have um, a little bit more of a, a higher end feel, uh, which would help offset the, you know, partially upset, offset the uh, complaints that we'll get from removing the GPS amenity. Uh, many of our local competitors are switching to club cars, which um, is interesting because they are more expensive. But, um, you know, so with Yamaha, uh, Simi Hills could be seen as falling slightly behind the competition. But to be honest, I don't think that too many golfers, you know, at public facilities look that deeply into it. Uh, Simi Hills has had three consecutive fleets at Yamaha, and they've performed generally pretty well. Uh, in the past few months, uh, partly because of the unusually high usage, they have uh, had uh, a little bit of elevated levels of failures, parts-wise. Um, but all, as all aspects considered, um, primarily cost difference and availability, staff recommends the Yamaha golf cart with the lithium battery and the seat upgrade to help offset the uh, removal of the GPS. The annual cost for this 36-month uh, uh, golf cart lease agreement will be $109,499.04 with Yamaha. Um, our current fleet, by comparison, is $127,525 with GPS units. So our overall annual cart expense will be reduced by $18,026 just on the lease price. And then there'll be some savings on power uh, if we upgrade to that lithium pack. So um, our recommendation staff um, recommends that the board accept the proposal from Yamaha Golf Cart Company and authorize the district manager to negotiate and execute the lease agreement on behalf of the district. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Okay, are there any questions? Yes. Did you have a question? Okay. I, I, I guess it's not a question as much as a concern. Hmm. Um, Based on the club car having a higher visibility as being special, um, I mean, I think the course is right up there with all the other courses. And I just don't want us to look like we're not competing or not competitive. I mean, I don't know if within the golf course community, if there is a hierarchy of golf carts and, you know, like a Cadillac versus a Chevy or something. I mean, do people play golf based on that? No. Um, staff doesn't believe uh, anybody will change their play habits based on what kind of carts we have. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I shared with Dan uh, a few weeks ago, El Caballero Country Club here in Encino just got new club cars and they got... Uh, custom embroidered ostrich uh, seats and uh, really swanky <laughs> golf carts that are, you know, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of twice, you know, the price of what we're looking at. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, a, an ego thing that, you know, if you're at a fancy country club, you want the nicest golf carts. Um, and so there's a, there's a competition that goes on amongst the private clubs, but we don't think anybody's going to change their play decisions based on what kind of carts we have. Uh, and to be honest, if Yamaha carts are just fine. They're reliable. They're you know they're trustworthy. We know them. Our mechanic you know has worked on them, and so we're comfortable with how they hold up. And we don't think it's going to change anything. Well, do you think because they won't have the GPS, they'll use the apps on their phone? Right, and um, actually in conjunction with this, thanks for bringing that up. What we're doing, um, 
at the at the golf course we've we've had all the sprinkler heads lasered so we know how far the distance is from all the sprinkler heads so we're going to replace and we we did this about 15 years ago but um we're going to replace all the plates on the sprinkler heads with the yardage to the green um we're going to put on uh, redo our markings on the cart path and in the fairway so people will be able to see easily how far they are and one thing that's changed over the years is a lot of players, most everyone has a smartphone nowadays, and we have charging ports in the carts, so they can plug in their phone, and there's 25 different apps that give you GPS information um, that are available to the public, so we think that's one of the reasons why we feel like the expense of adding on a GPS unit built into the cart, it's just kind of overkill, and it saves us a little bit of money to, to not do it, and we may get a couple, you know, grouchy people but um, in general I think most people will shrug it off I mean we've had no GPS for 35 years of the golf course existence yeah. and yeah. We, we've had them for the last four and a half years and yeah and we may get a few complaints yeah. but they'll still blow over I was kind of wondering why we were worried about a negative reaction to taking off the GPS if nobody's using it everybody's using their phone apps well they use it I mean yeah. and it's because it's right there it's built in and, okay. it, and it's handy it's visible and they don't have to get their you know their laser out or they don't have to look at their phone and so and as with most things I mean once you've given something you know taking it away is yeah uh, a little bit exactly. different question so yeah. uh, we'll get uh, but like I said we expect those kind of comments and they'll get over it very quickly and okay well i mean i we won't want us to be as i said competitive and i yeah if the gps is not that important and they have some adaption but if it is important then yeah both of the uh, um manufacturers brought demos over to us um uh, both the, the club car and the Yamaha car are, are both very nice vehicles. They both ride well. They're both comfortable. Um, the, the, the spinning rims uh, that Yamaha proposed, you know, that, the cart that they brought us had those, uh, not spinning rims, but they're fancy chrome wheels. Uh, it really gave it a you know, kind of a premium look. It made them look fancy. Um, obviously, it doesn't really you know, change the performance of the cart and it just adds to your maintenance expense as time goes on. If, you, if somebody bends a wheel, you have to replace it at a higher cost. So, I mean, we feel like the stock wheels are okay. They look fine, but most people don't rent a cart based on how nice it looks. I mean, they, they want a cart because they want to ride. And I was thinking the GPS. Yeah, I mean, I mean if, if there's no GPS, they're going to be okay. So I'll make a motion to follow the staff recommendation and accept the proposal from Yamaha. Okay. And I'll second that motion. All right. Gina, but before roll call, please. Uh, but before we vote, I just have a quick comment. Go ahead. Brian, uh, a lot's uh, expected of you and your staff, and you've risen to those expectations. So thank you for that. I appreciate your advice and your report, and I know that uh, so much goes on in the golf course and so much fun's being had, so we appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate that. And if ever in the future you find the need for adding solar panels to the parking lot to add shaded parking and reduce the cost of energy, I'm hoping to see uh, information yeah. about that. Will do. Okay. Now we'll get into roll call. Uh, Director Avila? Aye. Director Dunner? Yes. Director Freeman? Yes. Vice Chair Gray? Aye. Chair O'Brien? Yes. That motion carries with the unanimous vote. Okay. Thank you. Item, <clears throat> item 9C, approval of 2022 Board of Directors Standing Committee List. Thank you, Chair. Each year at this time of the year, uh, we take a look at our Standing Committee List and offers the opportunity, the, or the Board, the opportunity to make any desired changes. Uh, we did receive input from all of the Board members this year, and based on that input, uh, there are no recommended changes other than to the Advanced Planning Committee, which traditionally has run with the chair and vice chair. So with that, I think the, the chair has uh, the authority to recommend the committees, and she is recommending that the committee list basically stay, be unchanged other than the advanced planning committee. Yes, that's what I'm recommending. That concludes staff's report. I'll let you take I do have some, uh, hmm? I apologize. I do have some questions about it okay. for uh, our recommendations. I didn't reach out to the chair to express this because it involves more than talking to just the chair and doing so I can't really be with the Brown Act so I needed to wait to the meeting anyways. 
Uh, looking at the standing committees, if I'm looking at it correctly, I'm on one standing committee. Uh, that uh, doesn't give me as much participation as some of the other board members on the standing committees. And I have some uh, solutions to that, but I want feedback from my fellow board members. So I, I, if there's somebody that uh, has a strong passion for one of those committees I'm about to suggest, I can respect that. So like I said, I have some solutions for it. So I am interested in either golf courses, historical, or uh, the Oak Park Committee. I didn't express that to the chair because I didn't want to uh, ask Kate to do that. And then Josh was like, I really wanted to be on that committee and I didn't know that. So that makes it a little bit complicated. I see it as an issue of some of us are on three or four committees. I'm currently on uh, just one of the standing committees. That's one solution towards it. And then the second solution I have, if, if, uh, if any other board member sees one of those committees that they didn't want to be on. My second issue is uh, there might be open space acquisitions or discussion and just uh, routine trail maintenance. Uh, as a part of that, I, I'm good with the, the committees as they go, as they're uh, recommended by the chair. If uh, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy Advisory Committee, uh, that's a liaison to uh, their advisory committee. If we just change that to Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and Open Space Committee. And the way that I would see that uh, running is just how we have always done things for the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. But if there's an issue that specifically was about trails, open space, or uh, land acquisition possibilities, that I could be included on that uh, as part of that committee. So my ask is either we switch around one of the committees if someone's interested in switching with me, or we just elevate Santa Monica Mountains Advisory to uh, advisory committee plus open space with understanding if it came to Dan's attention, something to do with trails and open space, uh, that that's how that would be dealt with. Okay, so I have, I have a couple comments. Um, one, well, let me, let me just start with my general comment just to get that out of the way. Um, uh, as everyone knows, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of the committees and with the exception of what I view as the liaison committees, I wouldn't even have the other ones. I would have, um, you know, I would have historical, I would have Oak Park, I would have Strather, and because to me those are just, um, those are just liaison committees anyway. The rest of the things I think we should be discussing all as a board. Um, having said that, in direct response to Chair Dennard, I, I don't think there's an exact science as to what we list as liaison or what we don't. I don't have a problem with the suggestion about um, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy Advisory Committee and open space. I'm not opposed to that at all. Um, if, it, if it comes to um, if it comes to everyone making uh, making everyone happy, um, I feel like I've had a good rapport in Oak Park and a good relationship with Oak Park. But um, if, if that's something that will ease things and um, and Brian is interested in Oak Park. Um, I'm willing to give that up if um, if that you know if that pleases everyone. So those are my eight comments. Okay, can we can we swap Ed out on the Oak Park and and put Brian in tonight legally? Yes. Okay. And then uh, I would uh, as Elaine as member and Ed as chair. If we did that, Elaine, I would uh, like you to be chair, and then I'd be a member because you have more experience with it than me. If, the, the only other comment I'll make is if, if we're gonna, what was the reason for, can you ex state one more time so I understand on the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and open space concept, can you explain that to me one more time? Yeah, so I, here's my thought, uh, Ed, if a, a land acquisition possibility comes to us as a park district, uh, it's going to come to the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and then to the park district and the full board, but if it comes to let's say advanced planning, and that's Josh and Kate. At that point, I've already been a part of it because it was a part of the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. Right. So that would be three board members and we can't do that. So my solution to that is uh, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and open space. I don't have a better name for it, but that would be uh, where if Dan uh, was made aware of an issue or it comes to Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, it would not go to uh, Kate and Josh on advanced planning, but it would go to that committee. So now obviously, it might come to us as a full board. Okay, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah, so with understand. The, with the understanding that that um, I'm not a fan of committees, period. But 
Um, so I, I have no problem with that. And then if that needs a second member, since I'm giving up Oak Park, I can be, Brian can stay as the chair, and I, I would volunteer to be the second member of that. And, and that would be and give a second member, not for the not for the advice, right, for but the for the open members. space part of it, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Because uh, no. I'm good with that. I'm okay with that. I would just know that makes logical sense because the acquisitions that are um, in concept aren't going to involve partnership with the MRC and Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. Um, with funding to go along with that, so that in my in my opinion, that makes that alignment makes sense given what we have uh, we're talking about now. Okay. So I think a way we could do that, Ed, to make it simpler is since it's a committee, there's a chair and vice and a member. I'm the chair, and the chair will go to the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy advisory exactly. meetings, and then both of us will be involved if there's land acquisition right. or trail issues. Right, so just so that it's clear for everyone, because I'm not going to be making the motion for approval, but just so that it's clear, so the way this would happen now, um, Elaine would now be chair of Oak Park instead of me. Brian would be the second member of Oak Park. Um, Brian would um, continue to be chair and represent at Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy uh, and what is now the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy Advisory Committee in Open Space and I would be the second member for purposes of the open space aspect. Okay. Very clear. Very clear. But that's not a motion, that's just clarifying. All right, I'll entertain a motion if everybody's okay with that. I'll make a motion. Okay, do we hear a second? I'll second that. Okay, Gina, how about a roll call? Director Appa? Aye. Director Dunner? Yes. Director Freeman? Yes. And Vice Chair Gray? Aye. And Chair O'Brien? Yes. That motion carries with the unanimous vote. All right. Item 10, written communications of note. I have none. Do you have any? Uh, other than the emails we've shared with the board, uh, staff has no written, no notable written communications of note. Okay. Any board members? I'm not sure if it rise to of note. But I was made aware that the cows at Los Yajas were out again. And uh, I figured I was not going to call anybody on New Year's evening for that issue. But I let Paul know, and he said he would address it. Brian, we'd be happy to buy you some chaps if you'd like. <laughs> uh, that would be a part of the budget discussion, maybe. <laughs> OK, that's it. Item 11, reports by board members. Elaine. Yeah, we had a. Elaine, here. Elaine, if you could, is your mic on? Monday, we had a joint meeting. Uh, we went over all of the maintenance items and volunteer uh, opportunity on MLK Day. Um, if it works out, we'll be painting the fence, hopefully, that run our fence on uh, January 17th and reviewed uh, briefly the agreement that we went over tonight and the wedding and especially event schedule was put on hold till next time. Uh, what I'd like to do is read the event schedule that the Historical Society has for the year. January 18, the school tours begin. March 5th, you want to know your calendar, Pat Haven's retirement event. April 1st through the 3rd will be Civil War Days. April 30, Simi Valley Street Fair. May 21, the Victorian Tea Party. September 17th, the 40th, 40th anniversary barn dance. That will be a nice community event. What's the date on that one? Um, September 17th. Uh, October 22 is the Heritage Halloween event. It's something a little different this year, October 30th, Dia de los Muertos. November 18th to the 20th is the barn sale, and if any of you missed it last year, it's, it's a fun event, or if you have anything you can donate, um, that would be good too. And then December 4th will be the holiday open house. So they have a really full schedule for this year, and I think it's just great. And I'm glad we have the new agenda, uh, new, excuse me, agreement approved. Um, 
Friday morning, CSDA is having a special legislative meeting. And I think of all the years I've been involved in the legislative committee, this is the first year there's been a special meeting in January. And it's um, because of an agreement with CalAFCO to address key um, recommendations in the Little Hoover Commission report on special districts. Number two, a position on a statewide initiative to amend the California Constitution in a manner that could drastically restrict revenues for local services and render board members personally liable for litigation. That's coming out of our straight legislature. And third, a position on a two-year bill that would re resurrect the diversion of local property taxes away from special districts and other local agencies via former redevelopment agencies. These are really three key yeah. legislative issues for this year, along with some others, that greatly could affect our revenue stream for special districts and local government. So uh, this meeting is Friday morning and we'll have our regular uh, legislative meeting later in the month. But anyway, that's the kickoff for the start of this year. That's it. That's it. Okay. It's, all right. Brian. Thank you. Uh, the first item up is uh, Wayne might know more about this, but uh, I believe we have a 1952 pickup truck is still, or a 1972 pickup truck. Wayne, do we still have that truck? And is he, uh, the reason I, I took notes on it last year, and I know we're coming up with the 50th anniversary of that truck being in our fleet. Yes, and, we it, do. and it still runs. <laughs> still runs. Do you have any yes, uh, plans to retire anytime soon? Uh, no. Okay. Well, one, uh, the next time we're all together outside at the Park District office, I think it'd be cool if we took a picture of it and uh, shared it with the public because it's noteworthy, it's funny, and it shows that we uh, are serious about uh, being wise with their money if uh, we still have a, 19, a 1972 truck running that's 50 years old. I'm just impressed by that. I've been counting down the days until it's 2022 to say we have a 50-year-old truck. I came, across a, uh, I came across a grant application for cleaning up uh, trails and roadways. I'll share that with staff later. Maybe we're eligible and it could pay for a royal cleanups or other cleanups when that's from the state. And then for Martin Luther King Day, I'll be volunteering on the trails at Hummingbird. And I know a lot of people are signing up or are interested in signing up. And I was wondering if any of my other board members would be joining any of the other projects or maybe you'll address that in your board report. I know it's a, a day uh, where not everybody's available. Any, is anybody else participating that day? So I, I'm, I'm planning on, uh, what I did last year was I went to a couple of the sites and that was kind of going to be my plan this year. I, I'll wait till my comments, but I did have one question about MLK Day, but, but I'll wait till my comments. But yes, I plan on being at one or two of the sites. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. The historical society painting a fence. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Josh, I think you're about to say something. I haven't picked my site yet, but but yes, I've been excitedly waiting for it. That's good to hear. I'm excited for that day too. Uh, that's it for me. Okay. Ed. Okay. So I'll just well, first of all, happy New Year, everyone. Um, yeah. So uh, second, you know, let me just follow up then on on Brian. So I know last year, um, you know, we had the, the unfortunate circumstances, even though I think it turned out to be a great event of MLK Day um, with the pandemic restrictions, and there certainly is the, the possibility of that again this year. Are we staying, um, you know, we don't want to have the whole thing canceled if at all possible, but are we staying flexible to make sure in some form we'll be able to pull it off in case there are different guidelines or different restrictions. That, that's the one thing that concerns me because I, I do think it's an event that we need to keep going. 
Uh, yes, and we considered that when we put together this year's event. So I think that the grander vision, once we're completely out of COVID, was to have a group event and that kind of thing, but we didn't build that into this year's program just for that reason. And obviously we'll keep a cold, close eye on the COVID restrictions, but it is outdoors. We can socially distance in those projects. Um, so it, as far as I know, it's probably still a safe thing that's allowed to happen. But if, if we get different guidance, we'll keep an eye on that and keep the board informed. Okay. All right, and then the one, one other thing I wanted to mention, I, I do think this is a, um, an excellent improvement in terms of showing that our, uh, that this is from Rancho Simi and not from, uh, uh, in terms of the activity guide and not from the city, so I, I do appreciate that. Uh, I, think, I think we've done an excellent job with it in the past year anyway with, with that one exception, and, and now I, I believe we've improved that. The only thing I would still improve, of course, I have to mention it, is I wouldn't have the pot plant looking things as part of the logo, but um, other than that, this is a great product and I really appreciate the change. I had a, a question on that now that Ed brings it up. Uh, our land acknowledgement statement I thought was going to be in it. Is that scheduled for the next one? Yes. So that will be out in like three to four months? Yes, it should have been in this one. Okay. So I'll make sure, we will make sure it's in the next one, Brian. And uh, who was the staff member that came up with the idea of putting uh, our maintenance department on the front and the back? I do not know, and Mr. Miller is uh, on vacation this week, so I'll have to get back to you on that. But well, I, I, I really loved it. Yeah, yeah I wanted to comment yeah, on that I too. Actually, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, whoever came up with the idea, just pass on that. I really appreciated it, and I thought it was a good use of the space to show the Excellent. hard working staff that right. keeps the parks open. I, I agree with that. Excellent idea. Okay, is that it? Ed? Okay, Josh, you're up. Yeah, so I'll just tack on. I'm very excited for uh, MLK Day. Um, haven't picked the location, but would also encourage uh, anybody who participates uh, to add it to any of their social media accounts or online. Uh, to promote, uh, you know, the wonderful activity, and uh, so we can keep growing it uh, year to year. Uh, and part of that is just showing we're not only doing good work, but people are having fun. Um, I know last year the group I was in had an absolute blast. Um, yeah, I wish everybody a uh, happy new year, and hope that staff, my fellow board members, and anyone else listening, uh, stay safe. Hopefully. Uh, COVID numbers will go down, and uh, January 2022 will be a heck of a lot better than uh, the last year. Yeah, that concludes. Great, thank you. Um, I just have one meeting. I had the Simi Valley Historical Society with Director Freeman, which you've already heard about. Um, there was one thing that Wayne mentioned sort of as a offhand, sort of, oh, by the way, type comment is how um, some of the maintenance items had to be postponed because he had people sandbagging. Uh, did you say something about sandbagging? Did I hear that correctly? Monday night. Yes. You could have had people out sandbagging because of the rain. Yes. Okay. Where were they sandbagging and did it work successfully? I just want to get a, a sort of clarification on what happened. Uh, the first time I get to sit in the back of the room. Uh, <laughs> uh, off of Presidio Drive, uh, uh -huh. we were sandbagging up along the, uh, there's an access road right there that goes to our open space property. Okay. Walking along there, and yes, it did work. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Good. And it was just kind of an offhand comment. I thought, oh, yeah, we had rain. I wonder, yeah. So, yes. thank you. <laughs> Good. Okay, and I just uh, want to say happy, happy New Year, everyone. And... Uh, Moving on, number 12, report by district manager. Thank you, Chair, that's a good segue because I was going to report on the storms and the rain. So oh. we did get quite a bit of consistent rain for a number of days, which is great for our parks and great mm -hmm. for the community. Mm -hmm. And it was the type of rain where we didn't have a whole lot of problems because we didn't have the, the big gushers. It was just a nice consistent rain, but we did have the one incident um, where we went out and helped. Uh, it's an interface between our open space and residential. Um, there was an issue with some runoff and Jay, uh, Wayne's guys uh, jumped on it right away, right around the holiday and got it fixed for the gentleman and he was very appreciative of that and I'm appreciative of Wayne and the staff for doing that. 
uh, skate park's going fine. Uh, we did get Pickleball open on December 21st, and we had a nice press release that went out and some social media postings, and we've, uh, those courts are open and available for folks. Uh, wedding fees, we're going to bring those back either on the, your next meeting, which is January 19th, or the first meeting in February. Hopefully, January 19th meeting, we'll have the Strathern wedding fees back for board consideration. Um, uh, we'll have the drones press release going out. That new uh, ordinance is effective. That'll be going out this week. Um, Oak Park committee election. Um, each year, there's a certain number of seats. Uh, we run an election process. Uh, the nomination forms are available now, starting December 27th through January 25th. Um, the candidates will be introduced at the MAC meeting on January 27th, and then we'll do ballot box uh, voting on January 27th and 28th. The important date there is that if you're, if anybody, any of you know anybody that's interested in being on the community, they've got to get nomination forms in by January 25th. Whose who seats um, terms Ooh. come from? You know. I don't know that off the top of my head, but I will send that out to you guys. Yeah, yeah, I would like to see a copy of that. Yeah. I'll get that out to you guys tomorrow. Um, Simi Valley Youth Baseball, um, which is the complex up at Sinaloa. Um, I re a couple of meetings ago, I reported out that they were doing some, donating some time to do some field improvements at the Knolls. Um, in addition to that, I have a meeting with them Friday. They're interested in, um, redoing the fields at Sinaloa, mostly the turf. So I just want to give the board a heads up that I will be working with them on potentially uh, helping them, assisting them, and providing a lease agreement that will allow them to make those improvements at that location. When and where is that meeting? Uh, it is on Friday at 11 between me and Chris Visage. Um, I wanted to note that if the board, I think about in 2004, somewhere in there, I think 12 or 15 years ago, I did, sorry for not having the exact dates, we did a similar thing as a district. They borrowed money from a private lender. Um, they used that money to make improvements on those fields, um, and we accommodated that through a longer term lease. Um, so we're probably heading towards some type of similar arrangement. but. Just uh, again, I haven't had a, our first meeting is Friday between uh, the league and myself, and I will keep the board posted on um, that meeting and those activities. Um, another item is we have received, and Wayne, good job, our depredation depri permit for geese. Okay. Um, remember, that was a part of our five or six point bullet pen to try to control the population at, uh, at Duck Pond. Um, so we were successful in getting that permit and that is a big, that's gonna go a long way toward getting that geese population in a more, more controlled uh, way so that the park is in better shape. Um, Oak Wayne. Park, yep. Hey, sorry, sorry Dan. Wayne, I do volunteer for the A training, if that's a thing that we're going to do. Um, Adeline, I believe is the term for it. But anyways, if, I, if that comes up and I'm available and you see fit, I'm interested in that. Uh, That's it. We have an Oak Park community meeting next Thursday, Brian and Elaine. Um, it's our usual items. There's a number of items the committee has uh, requested that be considered. Um, so those will be on the agenda for next Thursday for them. Our January 19th board meeting, um, a couple small policy changes. Mr. Dennard had asked us, the board, if they would consider a youth services board liaison, so we're gonna just bring that back a conceptual discussion of that to see if the rest of the board may be interested in that. Um, BMX, I'm curious, I wanted to ask the board, would you guys rather hear that on the 19th or February 2nd, bring the BMX discussion back? Uh. And that's going to be a long discussion, probably, with a lot of... Could be. I was just going to get background on how we got to where we are and what discussions we've had. And okay. Either one, no preference. Either one? Okay. Um, 
Strather and wedding fees, uh, a small amendment to the birdie bar agreement potentially, and also, um, yeah, the youth liaison item. So that's it for your next meeting, and that concludes my report. I apologize for my disjointedness. I am a little foggy headed, so to speak. Congested. Sorry. Okay. All right, we have no closed session, so no item 13 at this nothing else to adjourn meeting. There is a, I did not say it earlier, but I echo the people that said Happy New Year and uh, Happy Tracer Reyes or Epiphany. A uh, lot of our community is celebrating that tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Great. Meeting is adjourned.